Hi, I'm Professor David Atlee, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Thank you for joining me. In this video, I'll be talking to you about the interesting story of the discovery of Neptune and how it connects to our understanding of the laws of gravity. Let's get started. First, let's take a step back and talk about planetary orbits. You learned that planets follow orbits described by Kepler's laws, or at the very least, Newton's modification to Kepler's laws. And that is mostly, but not perfectly true. It would be perfectly true if the solar system consisted of one star and one planet. But because the solar system consists of multiple planets, all exerting their own gravity, each planet constantly feels many tugs from the gravity of the other planets, altering its orbit very, very slightly. The good news is that if we know where the planets are and what their masses are, we can predict all of these tugs, and so we can figure out what we would expect the deviations from the Keplerian ideal to look like for any given planet. This failed following the discovery of Uranus by William Herschel. As astronomers began to map out a detailed orbit for Uranus, we figured out very quickly that Uranus was not behaving as it should. Its deviations from the Keplerian ideal were larger than you would expect based on the masses and positions of the other known planets. This led to the supposition that there must be a mysterious and then unknown planet hiding somewhere out in the solar system that was responsible for these deviations. Astronomers started using the deviations from the perfect Keplerian ideal in Uranus's orbit to try to predict the mass and location of this missing planet. This was an important puzzle of late 19th century astronomy and physics. It was taken up by multiple different physicists. Uh, the two who get the most credit for successfully predicting the location of the missing mystery planet are Adams and Leverrier. Following their dueling predictions for the location and mass of the mystery planet, a German astronomer by the name of Johann Galle went out and used a telescope to try to identify the new planet. And on the very first night, within a few hours of sitting down to work, Gala found exactly what he was looking for. He found this new planet, which was moving along relative to the background stars in approximately the predicted location. And in fact, Neptune was only about a degree away from where Le Verrier had predicted it ought to be. Subsequent study has shown that this was at least somewhat of an accident, um, that Adams and Le Verrier made some unfounded assumptions about the size of the mystery planet's orbit using Bode's law, but they did know enough about how gravity works to at least get the general direction of the planet correct so that we were able to identify it in our telescopes. This continues to be very important today. Astronomers uh, have been studying the orbits of trans-Neptunian objects and other minor bodies in the outer solar system, and once again, we're starting to find some deviations from the Keplerian ideal. And so there's been a suggestion that there are one or more heretofore undiscovered planets very, very far out in the solar system, possibly with orbital times in the range of 10,000 years or more, that we haven't found yet. Um, so this is a very exciting time if you're a planetary astronomer. On the right-hand side of the slide, I've shown an image of Neptune and its largest moon, Triton, as viewed through a small telescope like the one Gala would have used to make his discovery. Um, this is not actually a discovery image for Neptune. That would be very cool, but I don't have that, um, so I can't show it to you. Interestingly, as astronomers began to map out Neptune's orbit, figure out its distance from the sun, its orbital period, its inclination, all of those things, we realized that if you backtrack, Neptune ought to have been more or less behind Jupiter during the time 
that Galileo was studying the planet. And if you go back and you, uh, you examine Galileo's notes, you find that, yes, indeed, he saw Neptune. He even wrote it down in the image from Galileo's notes that you see on the right-hand side of the slide in the year 1619, when Galileo was observing the planet Jupiter, he noted a star in the background that was unfamiliar to him. Um, and he even noted that it moved over a period of a couple of nights and then promptly ignored the implications of that. So either he didn't really think about what it was that he was seeing, or he just didn't consider it significant enough to warrant some follow-up. So possibly Galileo was limited by the knowledge at his time, and he never even thought about the idea that there could be an additional planet beyond the ones that he knew out there that could be studied and discovered. So Galileo, despite his great track record as an observational astronomer, missed this particular one. Um, he could have had another notch in his belt, but he overlooked it. And this is an important illustration of a famous maxim in science, which is publish or perish. You only get credit for discoveries that you tell other people about. If you find something and then don't tell anyone, too bad. So we've talked about how the gravity from one planet can influence the orbit of another planet and tug the first planet away from the Keplerian ideal. These deviations from the perfect Keplerian orbits can be predicted if we know the masses and positions of all of the planets. But Uranus didn't really behave properly. So we we're able to figure out that there had to be a missing planet out there in the solar system that we weren't yet aware of, and then through concerted effort, managed to predict the position of that missing planet, at least somewhat due to luck, and then go out and find the missing planet, which later became the planet Neptune. Thanks for watching, and I hope to talk to you again soon for another topic in astronomy.